My initial thought that I've been just pondering on is the differences between uh, the children of Israel and the disciples that were sent out. This was my first thought. And so I just started, I just started looking at that, looking at, at how uh, the children of Israel, how they behaved and what went on leading up to their deliverance from Egypt and how they carried on uh, afterwards. And a couple of things that are very interesting to me is I've just gone through and just, just read Exodus, uh, and then you go into Deuteronomy as well because they're in the wilderness uh, up to the end of Deuteronomy. And so it's very interesting that, first of all, the, the Lord prophesies to Moses or says to Moses at that bush exactly what is going to happen, exactly this is going to happen, this is going to happen, and then you're going to plunder um, plunder the Egyptians and you're going to leave with all the silver and gold and everything like that. And then uh, Moses goes off to uh, the elders of the children of Israel and he says the same thing. And uh, we'll just bank here for a little bit in, in Exodus 3. Uh, Moses is like, I'm going to go to the children of Israel and what am I going to say to them? They're not going to believe me. And the Lord just says to Moses, just say, I am that I am sent me. And uh, they still didn't believe him. And Moses kind of knew that the uh, elders of Israel still wouldn't believe him. And so um, the Lord says, all right, this is, this is what I want you to do. And he, he sort of preps Moses beforehand. He says, have a look at this stick, Moses. Throw it on the ground. See what happens. We know what happens. It turns to a snake and then it comes back to a stick. And so it starts off that that's the first thing that Moses is going to show to the children of Israel. And uh, I think it's in Exodus 4, if we just go over here. So Moses journeys on, journeys on with Aaron. And so we'll just pick it up from Exodus 4, uh, chapter 1. So Moses answered and said, and behold, they will not believe me and they will not listen to my voice. Uh, that's the scripture that backs up what I just said. For they will say, Jehovah has not appeared to you. The Lord has not appeared to you, Moses. Are you serious? You, you took off 40 years ago. You think God's talked to you? I doubt it. But the Lord said to him, what is this in your hand? And he said, a staff. This is what I was just saying. And the Lord said, throw it down to the ground. And he threw it to the ground and it became a snake. And Moses fled before it. I mean, I'd run away from a snake too, right? And the Lord said to Moses... Send out your hand, uh, send out your hand and take it by the tail. And he caught it, and then it became a staff or a rod again in his hand. Quite incredible, right? And do this so that they may believe that uh, the Lord, the God of their fathers, has appeared to you, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then the Lord said to him again, Maybe the Lord's thinking, you know what? Turning a stick into a snake is probably not even going to be enough. For these guys. So God says, all right, I'm, I'm just going to level up a little bit. Uh, I'm just going to do something even more incredible. And the Lord said to Moses again, now put your hand into your bosom. So, you know, in my mind, I picture he's put it perhaps inside his shirt or inside his tunic, put it in there and he put his hand there. And then when he brought it out, the hand, it says, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Now, he would probably be very quite a dark, uh, his, his natural colouring would have been quite dark given where he lived, but he's pulled his hand out and now it's leprous like snow. And the Lord said, put your hand back into your bosom and he put it back in and he brought it out and look, it has returned back to his normal flesh. So first we see the stick, snake, stick thing. Now we see the hand going leprous and then going back to normal. And verse 8 says that it shall be if they will not believe you and will not listen to the voice of the first sign, then they will believe the latter sign. It's two signs. If they're not going to believe the first one, they're going to uh, believe the second one. But then we go on again and it shall be that if they will not even believe the two signs and they will not listen to your voice, you shall take of the water Nile and you will pour it on the dry land. And once it hits the dry land, the water which you take from the Nile shall become blood on the dry land. And so that's exactly uh, what, um, uh, what he did. 
and that's exactly what happened. It's interesting that when he finally gets to talking to Pharaoh, it's all the water in the Nile that turns to blood. It's not scooping a little bit of water out of the river, putting it onto the dry land and turning it into blood. And so this is exactly what happens when he goes uh, to see the elders of, the, of Israel. And just as I was reading that, I, I thought to myself, we have three things here in this passage. We have a snake, we have a flesh story, and we have a blood story. And so I just got to thinking, where else have I seen these three things together? And we see it right back in the garden. And we see that in the very beginning, you know, Adam and Eve, they're having a great old time. They're walking with the Lord in the cool of the evening and everything like that. And then a snake appears. And what does the snake do? The snake appeals to the flesh of Adam and Eve. And we see that once they had been rebellious and they had eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, as Scripture says, and uh, we see that the glory of the Lord had departed from them and they seemed naked. So it was just flesh. Their flesh had been corrupted, just like Moses' hand had gone from his beautiful tan colour uh, to the leprous colour. Adam and Eve, their, their flesh was beautiful, covered in the glory of God. Now they've realised they're naked and something is really, really wrong. And scripture says that they'd got some leaves to try and cover themselves, but it was to no avail. So we have a snake and we have flesh. And then we see blood in the story of Adam and Eve, where God actually kills an animal and uses the animal skin to cover them because blood is what is required to atone for sin. Pretty cool, hey, just as I thought about it. And then I thought, well, where else have I seen snake, flesh, and what's the last one? Thank you. (laughs) And so we see it around Jesus' ministry as well. We see that after he was baptised to show that he was consecrated, Jesus did not need to be baptised for the remission of sin uh, because he uh, had no sin. But he was water baptised to show this is what I'm doing. I'm going to do my father's will. And so we see the snake arriving again, that picture of the serpent again. And we see that snake tempting Jesus, coming to uh, just prove where Jesus is at. And we know that uh, he appealed to the flesh. He appealed to pride. He appealed to uh, things that people want, to material possessions. He appealed into all those things. And so we see that the flesh of Jesus overcame that which the snake had purposed to do. And of course, we know then At the end of the ministry, it was Jesus' blood. And we can call on that and we can walk in that because of the blood of Jesus. You and I, we are now saved and we are clean and we are made whiter than snow, Scripture says. We are made that sin is not even evident um, before us when we come before the Father. We are made righteous in him because of the blood of Jesus. So we have the snake, the flesh and the blood. Quite interesting quite interesting and I praise God for that and I guess in our own lives some of us have lived in the kingdom of darkness prior. Some of us have been tempted. I'm sure some of us we could think of certain situations where we know yeah we we succumbed to what the enemy wanted to do there, what that snake wanted to do in our lives and we can probably all say that we have succumbed to uh, the things of the flesh in our lives. We've succumbed to those things. But praise God that we have the blood of Jesus over our lives uh, to set us free from all those things. And so I was originally thinking about the children of Israel and I was just thinking about how, uh, how they behaved in the wilderness. <clears throat> and, you know, all they did was complain. They complained about everything. You know, the Lord had said to Moses, uh, you go and tell my people to go and, um, you know, do the lamb and do all that sort of stuff, but keep your shoes on and make ready because you're going to have to depart from here. And actually, even before you depart, you go and see all the Egyptians and they're just going to hand over the gold and silver. And so Moses had heard that. The Israelites, the elders, the people, they had all heard that. And then it actually happened. I mean... Imagine that, a prophetic word coming to you twice and then seeing it happen. Isn't that amazing? 
This is, we should expect these things as we test the spirits that yes, that is a word of God. I am going to see it happen. We need to remind ourselves constantly that the, um, the word of the Lord is yes and amen. It will come to pass. So they've come out and they've plundered with all this gold and silver and everything. <clears throat> and God's really made a way for them. And as they decided, um, they've, they've run off and then we see scripture says that the Lord could have taken them up to the land of the Philistines. But the Lord knew that they were not ready for battle yet. And so the Lord sent them down through the wilderness. And so it was for their own good. And as we know, while they were in the wilderness, all their needs were taken care of. <clears throat> and yet they whinged and complained. And I'm just trying to find. They come up... Um, after, after the water has been parted, they're going for a wander and uh, they sing this great song. Moses sings this great song. Miriam, Moses' sister, they've just gone through the waters. They're, I mean, could you imagine how exciting that would be to be walking on dry land in an ocean, running away from your enemies to then see all the water close up and kill your enemies like... That would have to be one of the biggest adrenaline rushes. It would, it would just have to peak you out so much that it would send you into song like what it did for Moses and Miriam. And Miriam singing in Exodus 15, verse 21, she's saying, Sing to the Lord for triumphing. He has triumphed gloriously and he has thrown the horse and its rider into the sea. And so Moses pulled up Israel from the Sea of Reeds and they went in uh, to the wilderness of Shur and they went into the wilderness three days and they did not find water. So this is off the back of being totally excited. He has triumphed gloriously, says Miriam, with her tambourine carrying on, you know, very free in the Lord, very excited. But they come to Mara and they're not able to drink, so they murmured against Moses. And then they were hungry, so they murmured against Moses. And then they wanted different food, so they murmured against Moses. And then when the time come for Moses to come up to the mountain, uh, the Lord's wanting to, uh, uh, to have fellowship with Moses. He says now, the Lord says now, the people better just stay down the bottom because they're not quite ready to fellowship with me. We still need to uh, prepare them a little bit. And in fact, they were scared. And they were scared to come into the very presence, that, that um, tangible presence of the Lord. But you know, even now, we don't have to be scared to come into the tangible presence of the Lord. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be worried about this because it is a, it is a beautiful thing. I imagine that Moses had such a wonderful time up the top of the mountain uh, for 40 days. In fact, you know, it must have been great because he did it twice. <clears throat> Hallelujah. So we have, and it's very interesting, as you go through and you read the Old Testament, it talks about the children of Israel, the children, the children of Israel. They whinged and they carried on. They probably dragged their heels and they wanted everything that they didn't have. They were never happy with what they did have. You know, I think of my children around the dinner table. Oh, no, not this again. Oh, my goodness, I can't stand this. Oh, I can't eat this. There's food has been provided for them, but all they want to do is complain. Why do they complain? Because they're children. They've not grown into uh, grateful people. <laughs> but they will. One day they'll be very excited that they've even got a meal. Uh, anyone that's fasted for any length of time, you're grateful for food. And so even in the last few weeks, we've talked about <coughs> sonship. We've talked about how we should walk as believers. And something very interesting that uh, was shared as we've uh, gone into our Zoom meetings in Malaysia, one lady, after she uh, learned a little bit about sonship, she said, you know, I, I have come to realise that when you're a son, you fulfil the vision of the father and your own agenda is not applicable. All you want to do is serve father and fulfil the mission of the father. And I'd never quite thought about it like that. And it's a beautiful thing because... Um, you know, we should be about doing our father's business, 
not worrying about our own agenda. Uh, I mean, look at the children of Israel. They wanted meat. That was their agenda. And so God gave it to them until they, were, they had so much they were sick of it. And so we need to be careful about the things that we want, you know, because the things that we want might actually make us sick and not be good for us, and God knows. So we have the children of Israel. This is what I'm getting to. This is the difference that I see, the children of Israel. But then we go over to Mark uh, chapter 6, and we see this is um, Jesus is uh, sending out the 12 And he's sending them out two by two. So in Mark chapter 6, and we'll pick it up from, oh, we're just after after the time where he uh, could not do any mighty miracles, as as we heard, uh, as Pastor Guy was sharing. So in verse 7, it says, He, Jesus, called the 12 to him, and he began to send them out two by two. And so... Let's just keep going, verse 7. And he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. So he's saying, all right, I'm sending you out. He's saying, all right, and I'm giving you authority over the unclean spirits. And he charged them to take nothing in the way, except only a staff. So just take, take a staff. It's interesting. I just, that thought there, the, the very thing that turned into a snake is the very thing that the only thing that the Lord has told them to take. Interesting. So he's given them authority over the unclean spirits and he says to them, take nothing except only a staff. Do not take a bag. Do not take any bread. Don't take any copper in the belt or don't take any money. But having tied on sandals and not putting on two tunics. So they get to wear sandals and no doubt those sandals probably never wore out, just like the children of Israel. In fact, I don't know if the children of Israel complained about their shoes. I don't think there's any writing there on it. Uh, And don't put on two tunics. And Jesus said to them, wherever you enter in a house, remain there until you go out from there. So wherever it is you're going, find a house where you're going and stay there until you leave. And as many as will not receive you nor hear you, going out from there, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony to them. Is anyone actually literally done that, walked out of somewhere and stood at the door and wiped your feet. I have, that's a story for another day. It's pretty cool, man. You walk out and you're feeling pretty righteous. Anyway, (laughs) that's when I was a child. Anyway, let's get back to scripture, verse 11. Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah in judgment day than for that city. And going out, so off they go. Going out, they proclaimed that man should repent and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many sick ones and healed them. And so it doesn't say that they whinged or complained. I mean, they might have had some questions. Fair enough when you go on a journey. What about this? What about that? No problems. But they just went and they just took their staff and they just went. And the difference here with these disciples and Jesus says to them, I don't call you servants anymore, I call you friends. And Paul in his letters continually talks about us now as being sons. So we're part of the family, we're fulfilling what the Father wants and we're just going and doing and doing with all joy. And then we go on and we read, when they come back, Jesus said, did you lack anything? And they're like, no, we had everything we needed the whole time. So we never went hungry, we always had food, someone always helped us, someone did this, someone did that. And can you imagine, can you imagine them the first time they've cast out a demon? Because Jesus has given them authority. We were singing this morning about we walk in victory and we have the authority. Can you imagine that? Have you, have you had the opportunity to do that yet with someone, to uh, cast out some unclean spirits? It's pretty buzzy and God gets the glory in the end, you know. And he says to his disciples, go and pray for people. Can you imagine the blind person, the very first time two of those disciples have prayed for the blind person? Like, what? We have done that? We have done that? I thought only Jesus could do that, you know. And so their minds were probably reeling, a little bit excited about, wow, we do have the authority. 
And so that same authority that Jesus has, he has given to you and he has given to me. And so we need to walk confidently in that. And I'm sure the disciples wavered a little bit. They were just men. They probably argued with each other. Uh, but then they probably had some really great times with each other as well. And it's like this family here. Sometimes we have some confrontation with each other, but at the end of the day, we love each other. We want a journey, a journey together. And so God is good. So we, we have a choice as to how we're going to walk forward from here because God is still giving us time of preparation by his uh, grace. So we can be like the children of Israel. And, you know, okay, you're going to see some miracles. Okay, you're going to be led by fire and cloud and what have you. And you're going to get food when you need it. But that complaining, that critical uh, attitude, you know, they probably walk through the wilderness miserable because of their attitude. And in fact, so much so, we all know this, that the ones that walked through the wilderness were not the ones, with the exception of two, were not the ones that entered the promised land. They just weren't, they weren't the ones, the ones that entered into the wilderness. They never saw the promised land because of their complaining and because of their murmuring. But yet the disciples just went with the full confidence of the authority of Jesus Christ <coughs> And we see that coming through Paul and through the ages to here we are right now, some 2,000 years later, that God has already uh, given you the victory because of his blood so that you can walk in authority. And some of us are still in training and that's okay. That's no problems. How did the disciples train? They watched what Jesus was doing. They hung out with Jesus. Uh, and so, you know, if you, you want to walk through that, go and hang out with the ones that are walking that way, that are answering those calls, setting people free, uh, praying continuously. Go and muck in with them. And then as you're trained up, you go because you've already been given the authority. It's good news. So I want to encourage you to think about as you're preparing for the times ahead, how are you going to walk? Are you going to murmur, kick and scream your way to heaven? Or are you going to walk confidently, walking in the authority, walking in the confidence of the victory that Christ has for you?